This is the oral history of William Jackson Vaughn by the Brevard County Historical Commission. Bob Gross is doing the interviewing and Jeff Thompson is the cameraman. Jackson, where were you born? Uh, in Vianna, Georgia, Dooley County. Dooley County? Well, between Vianna and Cordial. And what, do you, what did your father do there? Everybody originally in there were farmers, cotton growers. And when, by the time we left there, he was an attorney. He'd gone to law school or? No, uh, he, he went to Emory College, which is now Emory University. Right. But they didn't have, uh, have the law school there. Do you have any fond memories of living in Georgia? Yeah, I do. I'm a, uh, uh, the family has been in the Carolinas and Georgia two or three hundred years. In fact, uh, the place I was born on is still in the family and has been in the family for more than two years, 200 years. Wow. They were raised in Calton 200 years ago. So I was born in the cotton field there. And anybody asks me uh, where I was born or from, I tell them immediately, you've been there, which surprises them a little bit. And I'm assuming on that that everybody's been up uh, 75 through there. And the right of way of 75 runs right through the spot where I was born. Wow. On, on the old home place there. And I say, so you've been there. How did your uh, family end up in Florida? Uh, I don't know. I guess Florida boom was starting back in, what, 1923 or, yeah. or someplace. And uh, I presume economics had something to do with it. And maybe everything wasn't too good in Georgia. Anyhow, it happened. And where did they come into Florida? They came, they came first to Orlando, especially first of one year in Orlando, the rest of them here. And how old were you then? I would have been uh, 14 to 23, about nine, nine years old, I guess. Okay. Uh, yeah, I forgot to ask you that. What, what year were you born? 1914. 1914. And when did they come from uh, Orlando over to Melbourne? 24. 24? And what did your father do over here? Practice law. By himself or with somebody? No, he came over here and worked with David Peel, who was an uh, early uh, respected uh, uh, Melbourne attorney. And he was here. I don't know when the Peels came. Mr. Peel was English when he was born in England. But they were here sometime before 1920. And what about your mother's family? My mother's family is the place where I was born. The family as a whole came into this country in the 1600s and have been here from, from then on in the Carolinas and Georgia. What was their last name? The original, the original, uh, Emily's that we traced there uh, uh, were French Huguenots. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, what's her name? What, what was her maiden name when you married her? Jackson. Jackson? That's where I got my name. Oh, okay. Now, what about your early schooling? Did you go to school in Georgia and then Orlando? I spent three years in Vienna, one in Orlando, and the rest in Melbourne, in Florida. What school building uh, was there when you came to Melbourne? The Ruth Hennig Center building there. The center building was already built, okay. Yeah. As I recall, it had must have been close. That's... So you were just a boy in Melbourne. Uh, what was it like being a boy in Melbourne in those years? Well, you know, I guess those days you adapt and, and all, and uh, the first. Uh, uh, a greeting with mosquitoes takes you by surprise a little bit because they had them and sand spurs. We all went barefooted and uh, and sand spurs were, were something of a problem. Did you camp or hunt and fish? Uh, we did. Uh, and the boy, I remember the Boy Scouts, the first Boy Scouts, troop number one. I don't know what was the first 
troop, but it was called uh, Troop Number One, and uh, it was an excellent uh, scout troop, and we uh, went and camped at very different places on the beaches, out Kemper Lands, and and all around. It was pretty good. And your down on the river, yeah. Your scoutmaster, do you remember his name? Yeah, Captain uh, Finley. Finley? He's a World War One man. Oh. And his sister scoutmaster was Mansell Conkley, which is part of an old family here in Brevard. You were, uh, spent time right around the old Orange Spot Hotel, and you saw that catch fire one time? I saw it burning. Uh, and what happened? Uh, of course, it burned, but maybe it was an unusual thing. There was an explosion, and there was a burning timber that was blown across the road and landed on the top of the house on the south side of Melbourne Avenue, which owned by Dick Meagle at that time. Dick Meagle? <laughs> M-I-E-G-L. And I can remember seeing Mr. Beagle up on the roof that's where I push that burning <laughs> over there. Uh, in the 1920s was the period of time they dug up that mammoth in Mastodon over on the golf course and by FIT. Did you ever see any of that? No, I really didn't. Uh, we heard and talked about it a lot, but I didn't really get into it. Uh, okay. Well, in the 20s, you must have seen a lot of the buildings being built, like the Melbourne Hotel. Was Melbourne Hotel was under construction when, when we came. It was finished later on. The other old building, the Flatiron Building, the Eggert Building, and a lot of the, the uh, Tencent Store Building there, McCrory. Uh, there's a lot of them built. Yeah. What about the building? Flatiron, yeah. The building that you owned, the Med... Uh, Dennis Medvin, where your office is, the uh, Dennis Medvin building. It was uh, it was there uh, until that hurricane a few years ago. But uh, you didn't build that building. No, that no. Was there? That building was built by Mr. Walter T. Church, who was, I guess, here is like everybody else investing in real estate law and. His home was in Indy Atlantic. Did you spend much time at the beach when you were young? We spent quite a bit of time. because uh, transportation wasn't so good. Everybody didn't have cars and all. And most of the time, a lot of the time, you'd either catch a ride over or get there the best way you could, or bicycle or walk or something. Uh, all we had was the wooden bridge at that time? Yes, sir. Yeah. And did it catch fire periodically? I think it had been on five cigarettes or something thrown out. Yeah. Now, when did you go to college? Uh, was that before the war? Oh, yeah, well, in 1932. 32? And when did you get your law degree? 39. And did you practice before uh, the war? Yeah, short time. I, I started... Uh, I got my, my degree at 39, and I departed for service in 42. And where did you go to law school? Gainesville, Florida, Gators. Gators, good. I see you wearing the shirt. In those days, Florida was smaller than FIT is today. <laughs> Excuse me. Did any of your other friends from uh, this area go to school at the same time? Um, we had three of them went to Florida. Do you remember who they were? Lane, Curtin, uh, Cindy. No, I'm sorry, Lane, Curtin, Elise. So how did you come about going into the military service? Were you drafted or you joined? Uh, no, I... I uh, I joined a group. You would have been drafted if you'd waited long enough, but they had certain, they had different programs you could, you could enter. Mm -hmm. I think my program was entitled the V7 program, and it required college graduates to enroll in that particular service. 
And what did they do with you? Where did they send you? Uh, my first stop was Chicago for training. In the winter time? Yeah, January. Oh, <laughs> I bet that was a shock. Uh. <laughs> and where did you go after that? Well, we uh, we we were we were we were in, in Florida bases for for a while, a short time at Port Everglades and uh, Miami, including there, and uh, school in Miami. I guess my first stop down here was Key West. Uh, were you using your law uh, degree in your your military? Service? No, I didn't see what the law had anything to do with it. No. And did you go overseas at all anywhere? Yes, sir. Where'd you go then? Oh, we went uh, some up and down the Atlantic side, and then we went to uh, uh, Hawaii, Johnson Island, Kwajalein, Anibetok, Guam, Mauritius, Philippines, Okinawa, I mean. Wow. What, what are the Pacific areas? When did you come back? Or just 46. 46? Left in 42 and came back in 46, same month, four years. And you jumped right back into the law when you came? Right, uh-huh. Uh, were you in practice with your father? Yes. And at, uh, well, at the time, was he the city attorney? Uh, yes. And then you later became city attorney yourself? Yes, upon his death. Oh, when he died? Then what year was that? Pardon? What year was that? 51. 51? Uh, 61. 51. 51, he was. He, uh, we, were, we were city attorneys together from, I guess, 1933 to 1969. Wow. I guess 36 years, yeah. 69, were you involved in the merger of Melbourne and O'Galley? I was an attorney for Melbourne at the time. At the time? Was that an easy transition or was that a problem? No, it just happened. It just happened? And that was a result of a vote. The people voted on that? Um, uh, on the merger? Yeah, they were voted on. Okay. No, you did Most see. everything in the transition was out of control by O'Galley. Some way they had they had a three two vote on everything. Now, see, during your time as an attorney, uh, they set up Banana, Banana River Naval Air Station. When did the Melbourne Naval Air Station get started? Well, uh, at, at the end of the war, they. They were getting rid of a lot of surplus properties. Right. And, uh, of course, the, the, the Melbourne station, is what well, used to be the you know, Melbourne Airport, uh, it, it, it came, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what year that was, in 47 or so, I'm not sure about it. But it was originally the Melbourne Airport and then the military took it over? Mel Melbourne had an airfield there. Okay. I don't know how much standing it had. Back during some of those government programs they had, where in, in different areas would be getting certain grants to create jobs and all, Melbourne chose to take the airport. It was uh, originally called Melbourne O'Galley Airport. Mm -hmm. And O'Galley uh, had the same opportunity as Melbourne to take it to take it jointly. But when you took the airport, it wasn't just a straight gift. You had obligations that you assumed when you took the airport. And O'Galley apparently did not want to assume the obligations. And so they passed up the chance of being part owner of the airport. But Melbourne took it and assumed all the obligations. The only obligations I remember was it had to be called Melbourne O'Galley Airport. <laughs> now, you had a, a hand in acquiring more land for the airport one time? Uh, yes. Uh, I've always liked land. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, actually, 
you might say we were attorneys for the airport as well as the city because there's no other attorney. Mm -hmm. And I guess we created that Melbourne Airport Authority. That was kind of mostly, mostly our doings and our, our idea. And so I was very interested in, in the land and the runways and the, and the uh, competition. And uh, the length of runways and things like that, there was debates about Melbourne would never need more than a little jumper service to connect with Atlanta or someplace, and we didn't need a long run, a runway. But there was a, a lot of land there to the west of the airport. Most of that, as you drive along, as you as you go west on what is Nassau, what's it, but is, 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 is that land. And then, uh, then it came along with a request but I wanted to buy a part of the original airport, which is a part up on uh, uh, Babcock Street there. And, and if I got that, I think Mr. Coochie was the, was the purchaser on that. But the land to the west of it was owned by people from the Miami area and represented by a, by a broker up here, Yale Levy. And, and, Yale Levy? L-E-V-Y, Yale Levy. And I had told to him about that land and was it for sale. Yeah, they wanted to sell it at that time. And, and uh, I thought it would be good right behind the airport. And maybe someday they would want a longer, longer runway, which came to pass. Uh, so uh, what happened, I went to Miami representing the city to get a release of 25 acres up on Babcock. Uh, so they get, so that's where the shopping center is up in there. And so I went to Miami, met with the officials down there. I guess I actually used his name, the fellow I mostly dealt with at the time was Dave Kelly. Dave Kelly? Yeah, the another one was Jim Peach. I think they were the two CAA men that we, that we saw. What was that, Jim? What was that other name? Peach. Peach? I don't know that I, I would call to mention the people's names, but, but uh, you know, that, that's the way you remember. And I, I kind of put a bug in Mr. Peach's ear that they it might be a member could sell 25 acres and buy 300 acres out out to the west and all. And uh, he caught on, and that's the way the approval came out. The city didn't know about this. Really, they really knew no authority. But they were happy when they got it later. And anyhow, we went back. We could sell the 25 acres if we bought the, I think it was 300 acres. I'm not sure how much it it took you down almost to the main street down there. That was a smart move because uh, later on when they went from turboprop planes to jets, they needed that extra runway. Oh, they couldn't have got it without it. Right. I, I did the archaeological survey for that land that you acquired. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and uh, speaking, going still on the airport, and other things, uh, there was quite a jealousy between O'Galley and Melbourne in, in those days, and, and I don't think O'Galley particularly, they were jealous about getting this and that, and the question came along as to could we get jet service in, in Melbourne and all, and some of those objecting to the jet service in Melbourne was the mayor of O'Galley. Suggested they send it up to Patrick or something, not in Melbourne. Another was Mrs. Kerr, who was on the who was on the um, Melbourne Commission, and another little source there that I forget the number of the runway runs north south on the east water tank up at the end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, they asked about don't build that water tank there because it would interfere. Uh, but the aviation end of it, but they built it anyhow, and so the FAA ruled out that 
runway, I guess, for commercial service, still used for local. And, and when they had the grand little ceremony there, when, when we uh, got the transcontinental thing approved and fly, they had a little meeting there on the stage with Mrs. Kerr. Uh, take it on from, from Melbourne getting when she was fighting it. Getting jet service. Now, when they decommissioned uh, the airport, the Navy, uh, the city took it all over with the airport authority. Uh, they were using it for commercial businesses like uh, the old radiation. Did you have the, the, the city? I think used it anyway. The good. In fact, City Hall was moved out there oh. for quite a while, and then. We met in one of those buildings there, one of the better buildings. Did you have anything to do with Harris or radiation coming to the airport? No, I, no. I, but they were there, of course, among the better tenants that were out there, but there were others. There was an auditorium. And a lot of people used it out there. I seem to remember a tomato canning factory out there somewhere. But Tomato canning? Oh, there was a, there was a canning factory out there. I don't know whether the airport had any part in it, but there was a cannery out there. In the Humane Society shelter out there? I can't remember all the tenants, but they were. As I say, I know the city men out there for a long time. Yeah. And there was a movie out there one time. Do you remember that? They filmed uh, the movie The Big Leaguer. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, were you there at all when they did that? Uh, yes, uh huh. Um, did you meet? I got, I got a picture of my wife with Edwin G. Robinson in the store. Oh, do you? Uh, did you go to any of the parties that they had? Yes, I heard uh, Mr. Robinson make a speech to the, to the officials and all, and I thought he made a nice speech at all at the time. Good, good. You also uh, had something to do with A1A extending uh, the road down to, toward the inlet. Did you acquire some land down there? Uh, yes. After the war, there, was people were interested in land and going there, and there was no way to go below Melbourne Beach officially. Uh, the road went down uh, two, three miles, a little ways down below Melbourne Beach. Uh, I don't know just where it was. And the owners, we went to the county and all, wanted to build a road just on to the end. Of course, the county came back with, where would we build it? We ain't got no right of way. And, and so that was a, that was an impasse there. And, and to bring condemnation proceeding to get the right of way could take, I guess, years. It would take a long time. Mm -hmm. And so another way was thought of, and that was trying to, hadn't done, been done before that I know of that late, he said, get a voluntary donation of a right away, and how would you do that? Well, among those that were leading this was Boyd Richards and his brother Albert, so as some other folks down there. So what they did, I think they took up a collection, got $500, and they hired, I believe his name was Ralph Carter, who had been a state road engineer. If he would just go down and describe a right of way to the end that he thought would be acceptable to the state, and so Ralph did that. And uh, then, uh, then uh, how do you do all the work and get all the deeds signed and all? So we prepared the deeds this way that conveyed all the following described property lying within 50 feet of the center line. And so you got the center line, so everything was 50 feet, and you didn't have to run those numerous, uh, numerous things. And, and they, um, they, they got the right away all the way to the end. The lands were in generally bigger tracks then. The, the day they didn't have 100 feet tracks, but a lot of them had 10, 20 lot acres, you know. But it was, it was a nice little thing. So I remember taking those bunch of deeds we collected, 
there on Max Rogers' desk, city, uh, county, that? county commission, and pretty soon the bulldozers started, bulldozers went to work. You did that on your own. You did, and you did that, that. That. I, I give I give more credit to the Richard brothers than anybody. They, and there was a lot of others have too. Did all this footwork and the ideas and getting the, the names of owners and. Would, were there any resistance down there, people? I don't. There probably was a little bit, but I think they settled with them. I don't think any major would. Would make their land more valuable. Yeah, they, they can't get to it otherwise. Yeah. They used to go to the end of the quarter, you know, just an old dirt trail that had no official standing. What was your first job as a boy in Melbourne? Did you caddy at the golf course or do newspapers or? Uh, first job. I'm not sure what was right. We did do some caddying at the golf course. Uh, but we never did. Sometimes we delivered papers and works in yards or anything. Who did you caddy for? Do you remember? Uh, well, the, of course, the, the golf course is where it, where it is now. And uh, there were a, a number of those times that uh, an outstanding gentleman of the boom of depression days in there, and uh, he had, uh, I can't remember all, all of them, uh, Mr. Bills was one, Frank Bills, uh, and uh, Mr. McDowell from the Carlton Inn, and... Elton Hall? Elton, I believe he played golf, too. He was, what, how much money did a caddy make doing that? As I recall, you got 35 cents for nine holes, and 75 for 80, I mean, 18. Pretty good for that, those times. Yeah, well, everybody scrambled for those jobs. Yeah. Interesting thing, at, at the time, at, at the golf course, there used to be a lot of crows around the, around the golf course, and uh, the crows, if they ball went down, they'd go pick it up and fly off with it. <laughs> And, and so part of the time, if you had, say, four or people, you send one caddy on down, the, on down the golf course 102 yards to keep the crows away. There's one thing I wanted to ask you in particular, and that is surfing. I saw in one of the old newspapers, 1930, uh, there was a cartoon of uh, somebody surfing uh, in this area, it was in the Melbourne Times. Do you remember any surfing in the early days? They, they used to, they ride surfboards, lay down on the boards, or, but not not the way they do it today. Not standing up. Uh, or, or anything, and whether, but, uh, and then they, uh, they didn't have all the, guess, the good equipment, they use inner tubes, you know, to ride. They go down to the store and pay 50 cents for the inner tube. And if you could get a big truck tube, you know, you had a, you had a big thing. What about and, behind a boat? Did they ever pull anybody behind a boat on those boards? Believe it or not, they pulled them behind cars. On the beach? Uh, on the beach. The car would run a beach and the, and the uh, surfer would be uh, out parallel to the beach. You people used to talk about that it's pretty dangerous. You hit that sand at uh, the thing, but there used to be some of that. Was that in the 20s or the 30s, do you think? Oh, I don't, uh, I don't know the difference between the 20s and the 30s much, but uh, our 30s would be a good bet. Uh, okay. Some of them. That, yeah, another thing that is interesting was the main bathing beach there in front of the Indian Atlantic Casino. That they, they had posts they put in the ocean, uh, and uh, would connect them with chains or something. There's a safety provision so if people wanted to go swim in the ocean, get washed away, they'd, they'd run into a chain or something outside of the chained-in area. They should have something like that today. <laughs> Did you know uh, Mr. Cohenhoven? Yes, huh? What did you think of him? What kind of uh, man was he? I think he was, he was well liked and and uh, was considered quite a businessman. 
locally, he was a big shot. He started in Atlanta, he started Magnolia Park, and those, those are maybe at the time the two bigger developments at all. Did he build a golf course too? Uh, I would say he built the golf course. Now, whether he has some hand in it, I don't know. Uh, what about Elton Hall? He was a realtor here. I guess uh, one time he worked for the railroad. Old time was in here. Very nice guy. And uh, Madam Campbell? Yeah, Mrs. Campbell was a part of the original Campbell family. And they actually had a bazaar going down the hill uh, between uh, US 1 and the river there. Uh, Campbell's Bazaar was in there. And what did they sell in there? Uh, they had imports, from, among other things. They'd make some trips abroad. They'd come back with, with stuff, including furniture and, and uh, things like that. Uh, I guess it's an assortment of almost anything you, you, you could sell there. What about that house that was at the top of the Tristine Steps? The house right there? On top of the Tristine Steps, that first house, do you know who, who had that? Uh, no, not for sure. Oh, I probably okay. The Strawbridges used to own some of the property along the bluff line and, and uh, f further over. and. I forget the other names of other people in there. Well, uh, in the uh, the hunting club, um, the Melbourne Hunting Club, you were a member of that. Uh huh. And your father too. Yes. Uh, do you remember some of the people else that were in that club? Yeah, a lot of the old old settlers in there. We we've already mentioned some of it. Elton Hall, John Rhodes, Max Rhodes. Seth Rhodes, uh, 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 Carlton, Jim Carlton, Dr. Bean, Stanford Wells, C.R. Johnson, uh, Hollis Bottomley. Uh, <laughs> now, what time of year did you did you have camps out there, or did you? Well, oh, with the opening of hunting season, which would normally be what. November ish or somewhere in there, and go through the uh, gobbler season in the spring. Then. But did you go out for like the weekends or a whole week or did you? Both. At the opening of the season, everybody planned on setting up for maybe a week. And I just say, thanks, Thanksgiving might be right near the opening in there, see. And, uh, and then they, anything from then on, uh, several days a week, weekend, overnight, just drive out. See, I'm trying to remember when they built the bridge across uh, the St. John's River, 192. I don't know when they built it. When we first came here, there was no bridge there. And to cross the river, you had to go down south of what's now 192. I think we used to use a place called Avant Road. And you get on the old tram the, uh, that brought the lumber, and they'd carry it, I think it was about seven miles or so, and let you off over to the Bird Platte place. Uh, that's the general facility, anyhow. And so those old pilings and things were there for many years. We, we used to use the cross ties for firewood. Now, the Bird Platte mound, mm -hmm. that would be North Indian Field. That's, uh, that would be a big Indian mound, too. Yeah, after you get across the river a little ways there. I don't yeah. know. Did you have anything to do with bringing the New York Giants to Melbourne? This was their uh, spring training? Only as routine due to the city attorney. Do you know who was responsible for that? I would, without knowing, I would, I would give Charlie Herring Secretary of Chamber of Commerce a lot of credit for it. They're one of those things that they give you a He was mayor too for a while, wasn't he? Herring? I don't think so. No? He was Chamber of Commerce man. Okay. Yeah, the Chamber of Commerce. 
uh, I also had heard that many Hollywood folks used to come here to, to, to go hunting and stuff, and I, I guess Janet Gaynor has some connection to Melbourne, too. Uh, Janet Gaynor used to live in Melbourne with her aunt. She, she had an aunt that had a little house next to Melbourne Bank, that was the south side of New Haven. Yeah. By the by, the florist shop there. Uh huh. Yeah. And what about Betty Grable? Did she have a connection here somehow? I think Betty Grable had an aunt lived up at Hyde Park, Old Galley. What about the Good family? You must have known them for many years. Well, they came pretty early. The Chicago area. Mm -hmm. Not in Chicago, I understand, but some surrounding area there. What about um, Midway Colony? Uh, that was a retreat for circus people in the wintertime? That was on the south side, south side of, of Melbourne there. And for most of the time, it, it was just a tourist place with a lot of little colleges. That, they'd come and spend the winter in the colleges. And they'd provide entertainment for them. They had a little band shell, the band orchestra would play, and chords would play, and uh, uh, a lot of the way, wintertime was attraction for. But a lot of people used to come, and they'd come back every every year. Did they ever put on shows for the uh, Melbourne people? They used to let them come to some of the dances and things, but I, I don't know. What they did it was specifically for the Melbourne people. It might be mostly for themselves. Huh? Um, I can't think of his name now. I need to. Seth Rideout ran the camp for many years and lived there. Seth Rideout? Uh -huh. And I uh, forget who the other. It was also a connection there and ownership with that and the Old Andrews Hotel. Uh, I forget all the names now, but... Uh, uh, the Oleander was by the O'Galley Causeway? Uh-huh. Who built the big house there near Babcock in uh, New Haven? I think I had heard he was a bootlegger. Oh, the, the old Oh, Doc Sloan. Sloan. Yeah, you're talking about Doc Sloan's place. Doc Sloan. Yeah, he's on the south side of New Haven. Right. What can you tell us about him? Uh, I guess Sloan was... They were fairly old timers around here, and uh, whether deserving it or not, he at one time he had a reputation of being maybe leading bootlegger in town, and seemed to have a little more finances than most of them did. And that was a pretty fancy house for those days, you know. Was he really a doctor? Do you think? No. No. They just called him doctor. Uh, I don't know. He probably had orange groves around and and been in places there, but I don't know. What about uh, uh, even when I was a boy? I think they still had Bolito. They had some Cuban gambling games that mm -hmm. uh, some people ran in town. Do you remember that? Yeah, the Bolito was played. I I never that was before, above me. I never. You don't know I, how it worked. Got involved in it. It's people from. Boy, the main guys, I guess, would be from further south farms down here, and, but I guess they had local agents and all. And you wouldn't want to mention names because you could be wrong. Yeah, and maybe they, they don't deserve to be mentioned. Right. Well, I did hear... Because the some of the people quite respectable. Yeah. Well, can you think of any stories that you want to tell us? That your your grandchildren or great grandchildren uh, or great great grandchildren would want to know? You, you might say people think they've seen hard times, but I don't think if you weren't here back during the Depression days, as far as the Florida real estate, you didn't know anything. Land became worthless. People would give away the land. They abandoned the land. You could go buy tax deeds, buy Sell your taxes. You know. People be giving. No, I don't want them to pay taxes on it. You know, and uh, there were some federal programs here during the war. I think, uh, like some of the shuffleboard courts and uh, some roads were built. And yeah, there were quite a number of those programs. 
I don't really know about all of them or anything. Yeah, but but hey, a lot of them give it to create jobs and things. I think the clerk's office, for example, used one of those programs to index everything or something, do something inside the operations and other people who say, does other things. And actually, I think Melbourne getting the airport was connected to one of those programs. Melbourne, Melbourne chose the airport, some other towns chose, chose something else. And you speak of the airport, there were two or three guys around town that were particularly uh, wanted the airport there. Uh, and uh, and you in those days they used to wonder why you know and I didn't realize they, uh, the airport was somehow pushed it so that's why they ended up with, mm -hmm. with some of the uh, some of the airports airports uh, back then I don't know when I guess for for guidance along the coast they'd have lights every so many miles. To, to go for miles and miles and miles. Mm -hmm. And on my first airplane ride, it was only pasture out here at Western Melbourne. They didn't have air, something of, a fellow from Jacksonville, I think. I was his job, he'd go down and take us hicks for an airplane ride. Or <laughs> that or must have been pretty other. exciting back then. Yeah. Melbourne had an airport before what? Before they took this from the navy, yeah. Because the hey, navy, navy, I think, came to Melbourne because there was an airport there. There was a they grass. Had, they had a place to go and a place to build. There was a grass field out off of 192 somewhere. Yeah, it went down at, uh, south of town there. Yeah. The, the, I guess it was a practice landing field or carrier decks or. What about the Platt family? Did you know many of the Platts? I knew quite a few of the Platts. Um, they weren't all cattle people. Did Sydney have something to do with the hotel? Oh uh, yeah, a lot of them were semi cattle people. They'd work on the ranch when they were working downtown, or vice versa, or have a piece of of land and own. And I recall the Platts here, basically two families, the Cab Platt, Calvin Platt family, uh, and... Uh, Hiram? And the Hiram Platt family. Hiram's kids are Sidney and Giles, and you know, and Cab's are uh, Minor and... Roy. George and... and uh, Roy. Oh, that, that bunch, yeah. They had a lot of land. Mm-hmm. I don't. Uh, I think they originally came from Georgia down here. Did you know the Closies? Closies? Closies. Yeah, yeah. Bell Closie was a survivor of them down there. Lived down there to the south of Max Road. And what can you tell me about them? Well, they they were old timers, and I, I don't know. And there was always a little talk about first. The white child born in Melbourne, and Mrs. Good claims the dead. And the other point out, well, the closest were here ahead of the good, but they were on a trip to Merritt Island when the baby was born, so he was out of the city limits. <laughs> the Indian River Lagoon, how pristine it was when you were young? Uh, I, very pretty and uh, clear. And I particularly, I like the phosphorus in the river, it used to make a used to make a beautiful sight. It looks like the river was on fire out there. And the game is plenty of crab and shrimp and, and fish. And people would frequently they'd go on the old wooden bridge with a dip in it and the lantern they'd hang down. Or even without the lantern, they'd dip up the crabs and fish. And uh, it, it, it was very pretty, a lot of And you, you could almost count on getting a mess any time you wanted to. You see a rowboat going down the river, the water dripping over that water, and a little ringless of fire yeah, over that water from the. From the and I uh, you say a, a big fish would stir the water. Well, that's a big one. That's another one. And uh, uh, the river was pretty. 
uh, Mary Lou Connect. You remember yeah, her? Sure. She told me once that there was a freeze here where ice formed on Crane Creek. Um, that it was so cold. Do you remember anything like that? That, that would. I don't. I don't, I don't know about okay. that. Well, all, all Florida, you know, froze back down in eighteen. Not all Florida. This end. South Florida, 1890, I forget the exact day. Now, whether the Crane Creek froze like the places up in Merritt Island, they froze, so it was very well, although Mary Lou was old enough to remember that far back. Well, she was city clerk for a while. A long time. And her grandfather was the clerk ahead of her, C. E. Shaw. Shaw. She was she was with the city uh, most of the time when I was there. So. Did you know the Stewarts? Stewart, Arthur Stewart. Yeah. And his wife was uh, her name was uh, had lived on the river down there. Yeah, I, I knew them back for several generations. What uh, line of work were they in? Uh. Mr. Arthur Stewart, he was connected with the hard, the hardware and, and some of the sales businesses, businesses and all. And uh, Mrs. Stewart's mother, I don't know why I can't say the name of uh, Mrs. They were more like retired when we knew of the rich tourists and all down here. They had that house right down the river north of, in the north of the causeway. What about the Huggins? Huggins had a hardware store. Huggins, it's the same hardware store. Huggins bought it later on. Oh, that was originally the Stewart's? Mm-hmm. You know, speaking of, uh, of those houses on the river, uh, I don't know why I can't say names, but they did live there uh, on one of those houses. She had a maid, and she had a, I guess you'd call him a bus boy, a house boy, or something like other. And her house boy was a, was a Filipino. And the war came along, and he went back to the Philippines to get into service. And now, many times she died, and he was a beneficiary under her will, this Filipino boy. And nobody didn't know whether he was living or what happened to him out there. Oh. Well, it's so what happened. I hit the I hit the Philippines, and uh, went up to Philippine headquarters in Manila with the record, and they confirmed that he was still living. And had, in fact, had been there a day or two before. So, so uh, the incidental stuff came out. We found out the beneficiary was was still living there. Was he? Did he end up inheriting the place? Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. Now, I've seen pictures of Old Melbourne downtown. In Campbell Park, there was a bandstand. Yeah. Cause that, that, hmm. Do you remember that? Oh, I, I, I hadn't been gone very long. And what, yeah, I think it's down on the riverfront now. Yeah, what uh, what kind of activities did they have in that park? Anybody want to make a speech, they'd go there. The band would play on Saturday night or in the afternoon. Many a politician in Florida spoke from that uh Whatever you want to call it there. But anybody could go and make a speech? Well, it was like any other city property. I guess you could get permission oh, okay. to do it and all. Uh, yeah, where, where did you live with your father when you first came? We lived in some rental places. In that little house still there next to the apartments across from the school. The Bailey? Yeah, I don't uh, yeah, I don't know who owned the house now. And then they built their own home at the corner of uh, uh, McQuaid and Palmetto right there. It's, it's still there. And what was your first house? To me, to own? Yeah. One, the one I'm in now. Oh, you bought that? What What year did you buy that? 48. And that's, that's 60 something years, yeah. That's on Melbourne Avenue? What's, uh -huh. What's the worst hurricane you can remember here? For Melbourne? Yeah. That last one they had here, 
That's the only one that really did that that much damage, you know. Those early ones, the 26, they called it Miami Hurricane, the 28, the Palm Beach or Okeechobee one. They didn't, uh, they didn't do any real damage up here. And you've had those others that do some damage, mostly roofs and all. But we were fortunate, we never had one that really tore things down like that. Were there any other big fires? We talked about um, the uh, Orange Spot Hotel burning down. Were there any other uh, spectacular fires? Well, I'm sure there other big houses I can't. Well, the Carlton Hotel burned, but I think that was before your time. No, the Carlton burned. Uh, no, it was, we were here with the Carlton and the Orange Spot. One of the Carlton families, called Carl Burr, Carl Burr McDowell, he was my classmate, scout, bandit, and all that stuff. He was killed in the war, a parachuter. What was his name? Carl Burr McDowell. Um, and we, we thought we heard that somebody died when the Carlton Hotel burned. Do you remember that? I don't know. But speaking of that, somebody ought to make a, a little story about Louis McDowell. He's the brother of Carl that I was talking about, and he, his father was the one who ran the hotel and all. Now, he's the inventor of concentration. Concentrate oranges, fruits, and all that, yeah. all that stuff. McDowell? Uh, Louis McDowell. At that time, he was working for the state of Florida, so the state got all the credit for the, doing it, but the article was written, but Louis, Louis was the man that... He was a man that did it. He was always a good in chemistry and stuff like that in, in, uh, in school. He also went to Florida. <laughs> uh, but Who was he working for when he... Uh, the, the, uh, Florida, the, uh, I guess, State Citrus Commission or whatever the appropriate name is. And they've written some nice articles about him. I used to have some, but I don't anymore. You know. The purpose wasn't for the war, though, to concentrate? No, that, that was just advancing, I guess, what to do with it. Yeah. You were telling me before about somebody that worked for, like, Minute Maid. Um, oh, was that Johnny Evans? He was, Johnny was connected to those groves we talked about uh, down below Melbourne Beach. But he worked for one of the big. Students. He was part. He was part of a of a company over there, in the middle of the state that was in the citrus business. You know, Haines City or one of those close by there. I, I don't think it's Haines City, but one of those close by. But Johnny left his property to uh, FIT. I haven't seen. I haven't seen his will. They, I'm sure they benefited by him because he had a wife. I'm thinking she survived, you know, Flossie. Yeah. Um, Johnny used to own the Allen New Haven. It was an orange grove back at the time, kind of across over there. And some the other Mel acres. He, Melbourne Shopping Center is Yeah, there. and he lived, uh, um, what's the subdivision? South of Babcock, they have boom time subdivision. His house still there, yeah. Off of 190, or um, Babcock and, and uh, Melbourne Avenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have anything to do with uh, bringing FIT here, the uh, college? No, not really. We used to, I got to do favors for Jerry Cooper and, and some of the people there that were some help and saving to them, but, but, uh, uh, not actually spirit behind the college. He was the founder of uh, FIT. Well, you know, there was a, used to be Melbourne College or something like that that was ahead of Cooper, and I'm not far. I don't remember how far that had gone before the others took over. I think the people at Melbourne Village had a hand in starting that. They had a hand in it. Yeah, and then Cooper uh, made it what it is today. Uh -huh. Did you have any dealings with Joe Wickham? Uh, yes, I, Joe was county commissioner and all around for a long time. Did the city get along with the county? 
The Joe was very popular. But the city he got... He was also a contractor, and you could use him for construction work, you know. But the city got along with the county pretty good? Well, I think so. What about the black population? Was there any trouble with the black population? Probably no more than anywhere else. Anywhere really. else? I think uh, Lenny Spain was kind Lenny of... Lenny Spain was one of the... He was kind of like the mayor and... He, he, Spain had a bar and business place over there, but probably more among the well-to-do uh, folks over there. And, and I knew Benny quite well. And I always, I always got along good with Benny. And, uh, don't know of any problem. He was not a troublemaker or anything. No. I don't know of any problems he had. In. What about the Episcopal Church? It used to be on the south side of the creek. Um, you know, New Haven? Well, oh, they moved. Oh, oh, okay, it would be over south side. Yeah. Uh, you weren't here when they moved it the first time. No. Uh, but the second time they moved it out to Babcock. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was. When I was here, it was down on US 1, down in that area. Yeah. What about the fishing industry? You know, in the old days, it was Brevard County was citrus, fishing, and cattle. Well, the existence of Malabar and Miko was fishing, and Ogallia. Yeah, all up down here depends on fishing a lot. They ship mullet and all. Even Mr. Rossiter used to be in the fish business. Mm -hmm. They were the standard oil. I guess everybody was pretty much affected by it. Did you ever have a boat? Uh, in later life. What about Palm Bay? What do you remember of Palm Bay? Well, uh, Palm Bay... Uh, Palm Bay is actually one of the older community settlements, uh, at least the, the area was. There's, uh, there's an affidavit on record made by the keeper of the Canaveral Light in a lawsuit where he said when he came down here, first time, there was an orange grove still there, and I think that was 1856. Mm -hmm. And uh, some uh, Melbourne's first was on 1870, somewhere way there. Turkey Creek Grove was famous all over Florida. Um, Carlos Canova, did you know Carlos? Yeah. Carlos was an engineer, surveyor engineer, had the property at Ogallet Causeway in the ocean there, built the ocean pier out, out there, and, and owned the property across the street over there. I think his, I think his daughter Used to have a shop of some kind there on the Patsy's Shell Shop. Yeah, on the North uh, yeah. Pat Shell Shop. Yeah. And, uh, when I was about nine years old, I would ride my bike over there and talk to Carlos. And he yeah, would, that's that's her name. Yeah. Yeah, he would tell he me. He got a, the boy. I forget. Yeah. 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 The subdivision there too made along those yeah they call it right yeah. Canova Pier out there. The space boom increased the population here. When did that really start where it affected the Melbourne area? I'd say shortly after War II. I don't know how much ahead of that time I wasn't here uh, before 46. But a lot of the men that were but stationed that was good. here. Uh, yeah, I remember opening Patrick, uh, Patrick uh, okay, Naval, uh, Banana River Naval Air Station is what I'm trying to, trying to say there. <laughs> I was uh, at a meeting, I think it was a JC meeting, and the speaker was a, one of the commanders of the base, and he was only a lieutenant in rank, so he didn't have, he didn't have uh, Admiral somebody, just a lieutenant. He, I'll be darned. He came down to speak. Did you ever do any fishing down at the inlet? In the early days? A little bit. I never did much early fishing. Because I think your brother-in-law had a cabin down there. Oh, that's Charlie. Charlie, yeah. 
I've been down there a number of times watching other people fishing, and it's pretty exciting in those days. You know. Yeah, I think in the 30s, uh, didn't a, a boat tip over in the inlet and a bunch of people drowned? Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah. Because I, I think the owner of the boat, I think his son drowned. Yeah, I used to know the name of the boat. I think among the victims were Mrs. Locke Davidson, Melbourne Mayor. Oh, really? I believe that's right. Yeah, yeah I didn't know that. Um, I think that's right without checking. It's been years since I had so it. But... What about Roy Couch? He was important around here. Yeah, he was an engineer from West Virginia originally, I think. I think he built the first uh, concrete block plant here down there in Grant. He made the pumps, Couch Pumps. It was his big name. Yeah. Yeah, he sold pumps all over the world. I understand it, huh? Of course, he built that house down on River Drive and other places around. He employed a lot of people around the Grand area. He was a big employer, you know. He was also in my hunting camp. <laughs> oh, he was in the hunting camp too? Oh, camp. We had four or five, I like, would break off into a camp, and he used to be in one of them, I can't. Oh, I used to be in his camp, maybe. Be Do you remember how many people were in the whole uh, uh, club? I don't think at one time they had out of the high 20s or someplace. What we're doing here someday is going to be in the Library of Congress. <laughs> so you're going to be famous uh, you know, a thousand years from now. Uh, um, I want to get one of the nurses to take a picture of all of us together. So, and then we'll be done and you can... Let me get my camera. I think the stand somebody should be right there. You did, you did a good job. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we got a good picture. Uh, how about that? <laughs>